Okay, so clearly we're, we're approaching spring break um, based on the number of people that are here. Uh, everybody seems to be more interested in spring break than class, but such is life. Hey, by the way, congratulations, you're halfway through as of today. Well, not quite because technically we have the week at the end that's kind of a weird week of catching up and whatever. But in terms of the number of lectures, it's generally we're at 15 today. We go to about 30, 31, so essentially that's halfway through. Spring break comes at an ideal time. Believe it or not, I want spring break as much as you do. <laughs> so so that, that's the way life works, right? We all get spring break, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, I hope you guys really enjoy it. Obviously, it was my intent not to give you anything from my class to worry about. So um, the, the hope is that you would enjoy it. Today, we actually are going to have a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to create our own logos. How many people have taken 130 and had to create their own logos already? Okay. So you're not limited to that logo anymore. <laughs> you didn't like it. But if you did really like it, we're going to do a digital version of that or of some similar logo. Uh, it may take you a few tries to get to some place that you like. But it's also a great way to kind of explore drawing something that's not a font <laughs> in, in Adobe Illustrator and learning to draw. We're going to use a tool palette called the Pathfinder tool palette, which is particularly good for how you work with shapes. And I'll kind of be able to explain what compound shapes are and how that sort of thing works. Uh, but before we get started on that, we need to talk through uh, logo design uh, and kind of what makes an effective logo and that sort of thing. So we're going we're gonna to start kind of with what is an effective logo. I'll show a bunch of examples of logos um, so that you guys get some familiarity with what's working and what's not. The truth is that you see logos every day, right? They're on your car. They're on you know, billboards. They're on the backs of our iPads and our phones. And, you know, on top of your hat, etc. So logos are absolutely everywhere, and they're critical for branding things. And we are very brand conscious. We're very aware of these brands, and the best logos essentially make the brand. They make or break the brand. And so we'll talk through a bunch of examples today. An effective logo is very distinctive. And when I start to show you some of these examples, and you're thinking consciously about, oh, this is a logo, it starts to be really obvious. Right? Oh, yes, that is, that is a brand. That is something I'm familiar with. They need to somehow be appropriate to whatever the company is or whatever the company does. Whoops, sorry. Um, because that's relevant, too. If we had some, some logo that didn't have anything to do with the company, it can be a little bit weird. Now, are there logos that have nothing to do with the company? Sure. But they end up being associated with the company. So best example of that would be the Nike swoosh. I'll talk to you guys about that. Has absolutely nothing to do with the shoe. But at the same time, it is Nike. And it's, it's so ingrained in us, and it's been that way for so long, that we can recognize that as a very, very simple but very effective logo. Needs to be practical. Right? It's going to be on a lot of things. If it's too weird or complicated or big, it, it may not work uh, nicely. Uh, graphic, usually some kind of a graphic uh, association is good. Good positive, good negative space, good typography. All the things that we've been talking about obviously go into making a logo. Simple in form may or may not be relevant. It depends on the logo itself. And we'll see logos that are more complicated, logos that are more simple, and, and kind of how they work together. Uh, and it obviously has to convey some kind of an intended message to it. So let's take a look at, uh, at a few sample logos. These are all ones that, that certainly you're familiar with. Um, shell gas station, shell, it's a shell. Not a surprising association. Does that have anything to do with gas? No. But it is definitely a brand. Uh, that, that is associated with, you know, the shell name is associated with the logo. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, Volkswagen, not, it's just letters, VW, um, but at the same time, it's a very effective, iconic logo uh, that we see on an everyday basis. NBC, ABC, all the television stations generally have very iconic logos. Um, if you look back in time at how these logos have, have transformed, they're still within the same vein. I'll, I'll do an example with the Apple logo, and you can see how that changes over time. Um, Rolling Stones, also very iconic, probably much too old for most of you in the room to recognize, but at the same time, very iconic logo. Simplicity is also relevant here. Easy brand recognition. Okay, So let's take a look at the Starbucks lady. Does this have anything to do with coffee? No, absolutely nothing to do with coffee. Some graphic designer got, got, got excited, and they drew up this logo, and this became the logo for Starbucks. But at the same time, it's probably one of the most iconic logos of our era, of our generation. Right? We see this absolutely everywhere, 
And chances are you've never really stared at this logo. You just recognize it as the green Starbucks logo. right? But if you actually look at it, it's kind of weird. You've got this lady with a crown and whatever, like sleeves or scarf or I mean, it's kind of weird, right? But at the same time, it was done very well. It's very clean. And it became this brand. And it became on everything, right? You see it on every cup. It's, it's very, um, it's the kind of thing through repetition, it's become very brand loyal, right? Uh, it needs to be something that's memorable. This is an example that's memorable. One of the things that I would like to point out on the Starbucks logo that, that helps it work really well is you've got the large circle that goes around here, but then you also have the inner circle right there. And it's the juxtaposition of those two circles that, that helps to make this logo. And I don't know whether you necessarily saw that right away, but you've got the space that's outside and the space that's inside. And so you've got those two things. And there's probably some symbolic nature. I haven't read the history of the Starbucks logo, but there's probably some kind of a symbolic nature of the culture they're trying to create and why it has two circles and whatever. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that those things end up being very, very subtle, but at the same time, help this logo really succeed. Some of these logos that I pulled out are not brands that you're going to recognize. Uh, and I did these deliberately because we're going to show a bunch of brands that you recognize. But sometimes when you're creating your own logo, you have to be a little bit creative about how you come up with things. And so the, the idea, the halfway between a hill and a crocodile, crocodile hill, um, is kind of a fun play on words. But it also translates nicely to the, the logo itself. Fish bomb, another combination of words, but kind of a creative way of putting the two together. The other thing that you want is you want your logo to end up being enduring. And so uh, I'll show the next slide, I'll show you an example of, of what is not an enduring logo and why you might want to change it. But you want to think about a logo as being something that's future proof. You as a company, you as a brand, if you're constantly changing your logo every year, you're not developing that brand loyalty, that brand association with either yourself and your brand or with the company that you're designing for or whatever. Um, so whatever you design as this logo ends up being stuck as the logo for this company or this person or, or whatever indefinitely. Because if you break that association and you change the design of that particular logo, things change. And people don't necessarily associate the two. And so you look at something like Twitter, um, that has to be a very iconic logo. Could we change it? Could we shadow it? Absolutely. Right? We could do differences to it, but it's always going to be this little bird, and it's always going to be pointing slightly upward. So one of the things that can be very useful about a particular um, logo is to convey some kind of a movement. And so this bird, if you look at it very carefully, because of this angle here, it's pointing up slightly, so it has a little bit of motion to it. Do you guys see that? That can help a little bit. If the bird was not, if it was you know, more of a flat bird, you know, with the beak over here, something like that, it would be pointing just kind of, it's generic, it's static, it doesn't have that motion. So think about those little subtle changes that can make a difference. Think about 10, 20, 50 years, can we still have this bird, and can it still rec you know, be recognized as Twitter? Right? In this particular case, I think they did a very, very good job. So let's look at Apple. Okay? Ignore all the apples for a second. Original Apple computer logo. Right? It was Isaac Newton and an apple tree, and it said Apple Computer Company in these little weird 70s. Right? If that was Apple Computer today, would that be a little weird as a logo? Probably so. Right? So there's, here's a perfect example of if, if Steve Jobs and if Wozniak had, had decided that this was the official Apple logo and that I was going to endure, right? maybe the business would have gone under in 1997 when that almost did just because the logo wasn't there. Right? Good news is they changed. Right? Uh, 1976, they changed to the rainbow Apple logo, which was kind of the, the iconic thing from 1976 to 1998. 1997, 1998 was when Apple Computer basically almost died. And I don't know how much you're familiar with the, uh, the story of that. Uh, but it was very, very close to being completely um, you know, sold off, n nothing left. Uh, Steve Jobs had left the company. He came back to the company in 1998, resurrected it, and made it one of the most valuable companies in the world. So pretty cool story, right? But at that moment, Steve Jobs says, nope, we're going away from this logo. We're sticking in the same vein, 
same Apple, but we're going to a monochrome flat Apple logo. So we're getting rid of all this rainbow color and all the rest of it. We're going straight up, flat, uh, and that was 1998 to 2000. So two years of that. In 2001 through 2007, Apple started pushing this kind of embossed logo, a little bit shinier. It kind of fit with that mid-2000s um, range of shiny objects and that sort of thing. Um, he was pushing at the same time, and we'll talk a lot about color theory, and I'll show you more examples of this after you get back from break. But they were pushing a lot about this uh, product design and the fact that a computer could actually be beautiful instead of just a, a gray box or a, a beige box. And that um, in pushing that, they were trying to push the same thing with their logo. It was shiny. It was different, right? A lot of aluminum products, shiny products, that kind of thing. So they, they updated the logo to reflect that as well. In 2007, and of course, I lost talk for too long. Of course. Hold on. I have to reset this so it doesn't go away on me. There we go. Uh, in 2007, they stripped away some of that embossed glossiness. They wanted to get rid of that, um, and they kind of simplified it a little bit. It still had a little bit of a, a shadow that was right in here. There's just that tiny little bit of a shadow on it, so it's still a little 3D. Right? And then they kind of stripped away that to go all the way to what is now the current Apple logo. Completely flat UI, and this responds to Johnny Ive's change. If you look at the iPhone or the iPad or the iOS operating system, you look at OS X, they've stripped away all the shadows and all the gloss altogether. The interesting thing is if we jump back for just a second, right? Steve Jobs' or original rebranded Apple logo was flat monochrome, black and white. Right? Kind of interesting that we're back to black and white, or gray and white in this case. So it's interesting how this stuff kind of changes over time. But the logo itself is the same. It's the same Apple, same design. It's just adapting for different design trends. And I think that's one of the great things about that as a logo. So let's talk a little bit about the logo design process. So much like any of the, the design processes that we go through, whether we're designing a house, or we're designing a logo, or we're doing a poster, or whatever, Right? We have a, a, a set to go through. Number one is the design brief. Number two, research. Number three, reference. Number four, conceptualization, sketching, getting the, those ideas out. Five, reflection. And six, final product or presentation. Okay? Let's go through some of these steps a little bit. I had to throw in some random logos. I think this one's particularly effective because they're using just the color backdrop um, and then the text. So same thing here, brief research, sketching, conceptualization, uh, revisions, presentation. Right, I skipped through a few of those. But you can see also with the sizes of these circles that obviously some areas take more time than others. For example, right, the sketching and conceptualization is obviously the biggest circle. That takes the most time. Uh, but we still have to pay attention to all the rest of these steps. Right? So let's look specifically at the brief. The design brief is basically the information that comes from the client. This is what I'm trying to create. Um, this is why I'm hiring you to do it. Um, it's where are we trying to use it. For today, you're doing a logo for yourself. So you would be thinking of this logo as, this is a piece that I'm going to use to identify myself. It's maybe something that I'm going to put on all my architectural drawings. Maybe it's something that I'm going to put um, you know, on my notebooks. I don't know. Right? It's, it's a personal logo that reflects your own individual brand. You want to make sure that you include where you're thinking you're going to use it. Maybe you're going to make t-shirts, and it's going to show up on the t-shirt. Right? Maybe you're going to make it make stationary, and it's going to show up a, as part of your resume. I don't know. Right? You want to think about where you're going to use it, and does it work for those various scenarios. Right? It's a good time also if you're doing it for somebody else. Obviously, today you're doing it for yourself, so you can negotiate with yourself about how much you're going to pay yourself to do it. But, but um, if you're going to do it for somebody else, you want to talk about how much are you going to get paid to do this particular project. Then you go into research. And I think this is something that's very important that is often missed in, in you coming up with a logo. And that is, where do you belong? Right? So if we're talking about architecture, and this is going to be my architectural logo, what are the other architectural logos that are out there? Right? What do various firms use as their logo? How do they look? 
So what's kind of the standard of what a logo looks like in the world of architecture? What's the standard of what a logo looks like in the world of uh, graphic designers? And so how do those play off of what you're trying to create? Do you fit in with that or not? What other logos are used in the industry? What's the history of your previous logos? So you personally have already created, or a lot of you have already created a logo in 130. What's that look like? And are you happy with it or not? Is that the direction you want to go? Do you want to continue having that logo? Or do you really want to change it because now you have the power of computer as part of your logo? Okay. What are your competitors using for logos? You saw all the logos in 130. What do they look like? Do you like them? Do you not like them? Is there something that you can adapt from what they're using? Look into successful logo designs. Right? If you Google logos, there's lots and lots and lots. Right? I didn't pull out every logo that was ever in existence and show it to you during this lecture. So take the time and go look. What current styles are being used? So like I said, Johnny Ives changed iOS, made it flat. Then he changed OS 10, made it a very flat UI, stripped out all the shadows and whatever. And so now, if you look at companies, you look at websites, you look at products, everybody's kind of following in that vein. That's the trend. That's the design trend. So are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to flatten your design, or are you going to leave some little shadows and gloss and those kinds of things? Right? If you look at the Digital Tools for Architects logo, it still has a shine to it because I haven't updated it. I haven't changed it to be flat. Right? So maybe I'm behind the times, maybe not. Maybe I'm waiting for the trend to go back the other direction. I don't know. But you have to think about that, and is it worth changing or not? Then we move into sketching and conceptualization. And in logo design, a lot of times, really, the best thing to do is to actually draw and to draw out your ideas. So if you come up and, you're, and, you're, and you're, you're trying to come up with ideas, you can certainly work through this on the computer. And you can start to assemble pieces and, and, and uh, see what they start to look like. But sometimes it's better to just get a blank piece of paper out and say, what is it that I'm trying to draw? What does it look like? How do I want to do it, uh, et cetera? You want to fall back on your research and your previous steps. Right? What do other designs look like in the, in the field? What do I want to do about it? And then you produce a bunch of different sketches, and ultimately you get to a final design uh, kind of concept. So look at, let's look at a conceptualization process. Okay? So maybe it starts with a photograph, something like this. And then you kind of sketch it. And you start to say, what is, what is this looking like? Could I use this as a logo? All right, maybe this is a little too complicated. Could I simplify it a little bit? Okay, well, I could simplify it into more simple shapes. And so this is starting to be a little bit simpler. Right? Maybe I simplify it another step. And again, there's still some shading. So I'm adapting. I'm going from the photograph through these. Maybe, maybe I'll take it into Illustrator, and I'll start to see what happens with this. Right? And I'll start to lay this out as an Illustrator drawing. So I'm, I'm going from the sketch through to create this particular uh, design. Maybe it needs to rotate a little bit to match up with, with the way that I was doing it. Maybe we need to adjust some colors. right? And then we get something like this. Then we maybe think about some text that belongs as part of it. right? What font do I choose as part of that text? What does it look like in a color version? What does it look like in a grayscale version? What does it look like in a black and white version? All three of those are important, because sometimes you're going to have a document that can't have color in it. It needs to show up nicely in black and white. And then what would it look like if you applied it across set a set of stationery, for example? An envelope, a letterhead, a business card. Right? Does it scale? Does it work at that scale? Right? Obviously, you, for, for the scope of today, you're, not, you're just doing the logo. You don't have to create all of these documents. But at the same time, it's worth thinking about. Maybe it starts this way, where you do a bunch of sketches. Right? Again, paper is not a bad thing here. And you start to conceptualize what looks right. Right? This is the direction that they're going. And they're starting to apl apply different looks to it. If we look up at the top, it's a very 3D loopy thing. And at the bottom, it looks more like a folded ribbon. Which one is right? Keep conceptualizing. How do we make it into Illustrator? Right? Bunch of curves. We start to add the three-dimensionality. You can see it at the bottom. Then we apply some gradients so that we get the shadow. And again, this is not flat UI. This is, this is very much three-dimensional. But I think it works particularly nicely right, to get those little bits of shadow. Fonts, 
We're going to talk about type in just a second. Try a bunch of different fonts. Which ones feel right? These all look the same at first glance, correct? They're all very, very similar. Some are better than others. Which one's the right one? Don't make these choices lightly. And then you end up with something as the final version. Maybe final version on black, final version in grayscale. Right? Notice that there's a subtle change between the grayscale version and the color version. Right? The color version has clean shadows as it goes through. The grayscale, they didn't want to do gradients at all. All they did were they added these little lines in between to add that three-dimensionality. So it's still just the flat gray logo, but just having those extra little lines in make it three-dimensional. So it's a specially adapted grayscale version to allow for gray as opposed to color. So then we get into the reflection phase. And this is something that is very hard as a designer to do because you invest so much time in whatever it is that you're trying to create. But when we get to the reflection phase, you really have to take a step back and say, does this, in fact, look the way I want it to look? Is it turning out well? Right? This is also a great point, and you'll see in exercise 115, one of the actual mandated steps for you to go through today is to turn to your neighbor and say, what do you think of this? Right? So you have to ask other people what they think. Get feedback. Right? You could obviously you could ask the client. You could present them with an idea. In the case of today, you're the client, so it doesn't make sense to present yourself with the idea. But you could ask the client what they think about a particular logo. Sure. But you also have a bunch of fellow designers around you. Ask them what they think. Okay. Receive the feedback. Let your ideas mature. Evolve the ideas. And you'll end up with a better logo in the process. I love this one. This is one of those double, you know, you, you can see the hands, but then you can see the rabbit. And so the positive and negative space work really well. And it becomes grab it. Hands, rabbit, I don't know. I think it's cool. This is a Japanese beer, but a very, very iconic logo to it. I don't know that it's necessarily the most successful representation of beer, but at the same time, it's something that's branded across a whole product line, all the way to the, uh, the business cards themselves. You want to distill out the best ideas and make the final version to show the client. But sometimes that final version needs to have some variation. And I use the Mall of America example here because I think it's a good adaptation on a theme. So the logo is really a theme. And then the various how this, how this populates, let me show the next slide, depends on the time of year. Um, but it's essentially the same logo, the same ribbon. Uh, and they can change it based on uh, you know, different color schemes for different holidays. They can change it based on you want a background pattern or not. You can do the star version, or you can do just the little ribbon, uh, the opened ribbon. All of these are within the same family, and they can vary based on their use. But it's, it's a really nice way of showing a diversity of what this logo can become. You want to learn for, from others. What brands succeed and why? So Nike, particularly successful brand, right? Part of that, that, that branding is that it's such an iconic, simple logo, and it shows up everywhere. And we get used to it. Right? Certainly, if you watch any sports, you're used to it as a logo. So you want to think about why these brands succeed. What are the particularly successful brands that are out there? Some logos are purely type-based. They don't have any picture associated with them. It's just letters. And I'll show you an example in just a second, which, are, which will be very, very obvious to you. But when you start working with a particular set of characters, a particular font, et cetera, all the really intimate details matter. So we talked about tracking the space between individual letters. This is critical in a logo if you're going to do it. Furthermore, picking an actual font might not be the, the right solution. You may have to create this all on your own. You may have to create the letters all by yourself. Well, one of the fonts might be OK. Is the font going to go out of style? When we talked about the typography uh, lecture, I talked about papyrus, which was really big in the mid-2000s, early 2000s slash mid-2000s, totally out now as a trend. So if your logo was based on papyrus, your logo would be kind of out of fashion. So you want to really think carefully if it's going to be a type-based logo, will your logo survive? Will it last? And will you have to change it because the font's out of style? Um, you might have to make your own fonts. Does it reflect the business? 
Um, remember, if you're doing a font based, maybe loading a custom font is a good idea. You might not use one of the ones that's already on these computers. You all know how to do that. We've just emphasized it last class. And the little details matter. So here's some of the most iconic text based logos that are out there, right? All of these have nothing more than the font. That's it. But they're very, very recognizable. Right? Uh, we'll talk about FedEx in just a second. But Coke, IBM, CNN, Disney. Disney is a huge, it's just the font script itself. I mean, to me, Disney, this is probably one of the worst logos because it looks like it ends in a P, not a Y. But that's the font. And everybody knows it's Disney. And I think as a kid, I always thought it was Disney, but I could never figure out how to pronounce it correctly because it's kind of weird, right? So you want to think about if you made that choice, is that the right choice for you or not? I'm picking on Disney, so be it, right? Uh, NASA, very iconic, um, very 60s, 50s, 60s, but it's kind of blasted. It's reasonable. OK, you guys ready for your mind to be blown? There's something hidden in the FedEx logo. You will never look at the FedEx logo again the same way. There. Oh, man. Yes. Some of you already know it, right? There's an arrow right there. So again, it implies movement. You guys are too good. Usually, I can get everybody. Anyway, so the arrow is great, right? Little subtle thing that happens in a particular logo, making it active, making it unique. It's not something that's overly obvious, but it's a great little nugget um, kind of on the side. So anyway, no surprises for you. Uh, Text-based logo with a little bit behind it. Uh, I think it's particularly effective here. Notice the difference in the two fonts, right? The fonts are the same, but the weights change. One's a little bit thicker then thinner, that combination can be really nice in a logo. I think this is great. Just the little lines and the separation of these letters, it just works really nice. It feels great. I have no idea what the company does. So the other thing that you want to do is you want to avoid cliches. You can't just pick out the word clip art and expect to use that as your logo. Right? It's the one telltale sign of somebody who's like uh, an independent business person, stay-at-home mom running a business you know, a business card with clip art on it. Right? Can't do it. No light bulbs for ideas, no globes for international. You get the idea. Make something unique that is particularly you. Don't copy another logo. It'll be very, very obvious when you copy another logo because that logo exists, that brand already exists. You have to be you, you have to be, um, you know, something that reflects you. And that's one of the challenges. Output files. So remember, this is vector-based, so we can make it really, really large. We obviously want to save the Adobe Illustrator file, the AI file, because that's where we can go back and make it larger if we want it. Okay? Um, for, for our purposes, we're going to do one PNG at 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels. This is what we'll start with. This is the print version. It's high resolution. Can always be scaled down if we need it to be. Then we can do a smaller version. Uh, we can do a really small 16 by 16 or 32 by 32 that represent the little tiny, if you open up a web browser, there's a little tiny logo that appears in the corner. It's a little tiny square, 16 by 16. So you want to think about how this scales all the way down. You want to think about black and white, color, grayscale, and how do your logos work in those various pieces as well. So now I'll just flip through a bunch of other logos that I think are, are nicely done and kind of entertaining at the same time. The paperclip cloud, I think, was a particularly good one. I don't know why I like that one. It's silly. I like that one, too. Bunch more. We obviously talked about the Apple logo, the CBSI, um, the London Underground. These are all very, very iconic logos. I think that one's a particularly good one. One last conceptualization. This was for a jigsaw internet company. Bunch of sketches trying to figure out what, what was right. Initial kind of modeling thing. This feels very early 2000s eBay-esque, right? The colors, Google, etc. cetera. Um, adaptation into blue, still a little bit weird. The font choice is a little bit weird. 
Moving forward, this one's a little bit cleaner, feels a little bit more current. And then they get to the version that they ended up settling on uh, with the little jigsaw puzzles. So you know you kind of have to play around with these ideas uh, to get the final result. So we're going to move from here. There's what it looks like in the business card. Um, we're going to move from here over into the world of Illustrator and talk about the uh, Pathfinder tools. OK, so we're going to go ahead and open up uh, Adobe Illustrator. And we need to create our 1500 by 1500 pixel document. So I'll go to File and then New, which brings up the New Document dialog box. Um, thus far, we haven't created a new document in Illustrator yet. Um, so it's a little bit different than InDesign, but it's still in the same vein or still in the same uh, realm as an InDesign file. Did I say InDesign or Illustrator? Uh, anyway, you get the idea. So under, under New Document, we'll give it a name, something like that. And artboards are basically crops for a particular um, output files. We're going to leave it as one. When we come down here to size, it's set at custom. I have set my units to pixels instead of in inches. And once I'm in pixels, I can type 1500px and 1500px. We do have the ability to bleed off the edge of the page. I'm not going to worry about that for right now. And we also have color mode. We'll talk about color mode on the Wednesday after you get back from spring break and what colors are and, and, and how these different modes work. Um, since we're going to be creating a print document, we may want to switch to CMYK, but it's fine. We can leave it as RGB for now. Our um, high 300 PPI, and then I'll go ahead and say OK. And that then gives me my 1500 pixel by 1500 pixel drawing to work within. Uh, and you can see that in Illustrator, the stuff in the background that's gray is stuff that's off the page. The white area is what's actually on the page and what I can work with. So now it's a matter of starting to create shapes and or text to build up whatever my logo would be. So I'm going to start with the rectangle tool over here. And I want the rectangle to have no stroke. So I'll turn off the stroke. And I want it to have a colored fill. So I'm going to double click on the fill color. And I'm going to pick uh, a fill color. Now I could pick any color that I want, but we'll go with red for right now. Uh, because I think it'll show up nicely on the projector. So I know that I want a square. And so if I hold down Shift, instead of being able to control the, the width and height of the rectangle, if I hold down Square, or if I hold down Shift, I'll know that I'm going to get a square. So we'll do something like this. Now remember, any of these objects can be resized after the fact. Um, so if I make them a little bit smaller and I ultimately want my, my logos to be bigger, it's just a matter of selecting and then enlarging, uh, transforming them and making them larger. So then let me go ahead and create um, a letter. And so I'll use the Type tool. I'll click to Start. And I'm going to do a lowercase g. Uh, and again, you're going to do whatever feels right for you. And we'll make this font size bigger. That's definitely not big enough. How about maybe not that big. Move this down a little bit more. Yeah, something like that. Now remember, I also want to take the time and decide which font is the right font. You know, do I want it to be some kind of old English font, or do I want it to be, um, you know, a modernist font? We're going to have to to sort through that. Um, you know, I think I'm going to go back to like an Arial or something like that. Arial in a bold format. OK, so something like that. So right now, I have this letter on top of my background. Now, I could take my letter, and I could turn that letter from being black to being white. And then this would look like it was actually cut out from the shape. But the square behind it is essentially just a square, and the letter is essentially just the shape. So what I want to do is I want to explore making these into one shape, such that the G would actually be transparent. And I'll show you how this works by adding one more rectangle that goes behind these other two. 
Um, let's make it a different color. And I'm going to right click, go to Arrange, Send to Back so that it's behind everything else. And this will help us kind of see what's going on. This letter is still an actual type. So I need to convert it into an object. Just like we did in InDesign with the type, uh, I'm going to select it and go up to Type, Create Outlines, which will then make an object based on paths out of this uh, particular shape. Let me go ahead and move this over so it's right on the edge, something like that. I want it to be right on that edge. And then I'm going to open up a window called the Pathfinder window. So I'm going to go to Window. And it's called Pathfinder. And it will open up right here. So the Pathfinder has what are called shape modes. And these shape modes will allow us to work with these shapes. Uh, and so we'll go through the, the first shape modes, and then we'll come down to the Pathfinders in just a second. Uh, I'm not going to line this up quite yet, because I think it'll be easier to see it if I have these overlapping like that. So the first shape mode here, if I take my G and I take my background square, and I click on the first shape mode, what it's going to do is it's going to, quote, unite the two pieces. So it'll make one piece out of them. So when I do that, you see that the whole thing turns white, because that was the color of the object that was on top. And it's joined the square with the rest of the G that's on this side. Let me back up one step. And let me pull this over. Sorry, two steps. Pull this over a little bit further, and maybe you can see it better. When I unite. And let, actually, let me change the color of the G for right now. All right, just so you can see this a little bit better. So I'll take this, and I'll take this, and I'll unite them. And the whole thing becomes one object, including the G that's on the side. Does that make sense? So I'm adding the two together. If instead I click the next one, it would be subtracting the one that's in front. So the G is in front, so it's going to cut out this area of the final piece. So you see how that cut it out and is now transparent. So the shape went from being a square to having this piece cut out of it. Go back for a second to there. If we move on to the third one, it's going to create an intersection. So it's wherever the two overlap that I'll be left with. So it's just that part of the G. So you can see how this is really quickly starting to transform my shape. The last one is going to keep everything except for where they intersect. So I end up with that, where I've kept the outside here and I've gotten rid of the inside there. So let's look down below at the Pathfinder tools. So the Pathfinders are very, very similar to the shape modes. The difference is that it will create individual little pieces rather than um, just uniting them together. So this one that's called Divide will give me separate pieces. And I'll have to use the Direct Select tool to pick these. But I will essentially get separate pieces for, for all of the pieces that overlap. So it's taken the square and the, the, the G, and it's chopped them up wherever they intersect into separate little pieces. So let's put those back together. And then here, which is trim, when I do that, it's going to leave the G, but it's going to cut it out the G from the square. So I've essentially kept this top piece, but cut it out from the bottom piece. Let's go back again. This one is merge, right? which basically takes the two, puts them together, and keeps them. Against the direct select tool, the white arrow will always let you um, select the individual pieces. The last one here, crop, is going to be keep just the pieces here and here. So they're there, but I have no fill anymore. This one is outline, which is going to create just outlines of my shapes. I know these are probably almost impossible for you to see on the projector, but they are, in fact, there. And the last one here is minus the rear, which I'm not exactly sure what the value of that is, but it's available for you <laughs> if you want it to be. 
So if I went back to my actual objects here, maybe the logo that I wanted to create, let me step back one more. I'll put this G down here in the corner, like that. And then I'll take this object and this object, and I'm going to subtract the object that's on front, such that that's transparent. And then I end up with whatever my logo is. Now, obviously, I can change the color of this logo to be something else. So if I didn't like red and I wanted it to be you know, orange, I could change that logo to be orange. So I have some flexibility with how this starts to come together. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, maybe I want another line to go around the outside of this. So maybe I'll flip the colors and I'll draw a shape that goes around the outside of it. Something like that. And then maybe I'll come in with the stroke and I'll increase the stroke so we can see it a little bit more. Something like that. And so maybe I'm happy with this as a result and this becomes my, my logo. Now one of the things that you'll find is that you a lot of times need to play around with different strategies. Right? So maybe I'm working within this context of the square with the letter cut out of it, but maybe I don't know that this is for sure the one that I want. So let me look at other options. So I'll open up the layers. I'll go to new layer. I'll turn off the one that I was working on, and I'll start again. So let's flip the colors. And this time, maybe I'll change, and I'll put uh, a G and an A together. Right? And maybe I don't like that font anymore, so we'll try you know, a different font. Maybe I want them to be centered. So let me go ahead and go to Type, Create Outlines. And we'll center those two so that they fall in the center. Actually, I think these need to go down a little bit more. Feel better there. And I'll do the same thing where I'll select these two objects. I'll use the Pathfinder tools and I'll subtract the front object. And now I have a different version of the same thing. I could even draw the, the border around the outside. And I could increase the stroke. Something like that. So you see how I can go through and I can create different versions of the files uh, using different layers until I find one that looks right. So maybe I like this one more. Maybe I like this one more. The point is just by varying the fonts, I can create almost an infinite number of these logos. And it's going to take me some time to sort out which font is right, which one looks right. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm not limited by any means to just using type. Those just happen to be the examples that I chose. I could instead, let's do, say, a circle. Something like that. Let me flip the colors. And let me not do this one in orange. I'm tired of orange. And maybe instead of type this time, I'll take a polygon. And I'll put it inside so that one's centered on the other. And I could change the color of the upper one just so that you guys can see it. Like that. Maybe I'll take this, and once again, I'll use the Pathfinder to subtract the center. Maybe this whole thing needs to rotate a bit. So it's more like that. And maybe I need something around the outside of this as well. Let me use another polygon. There. Uh, let me change the color of this one. And let me arrange, send to back. By the way, none of this for me has, is scripted. So <laughs> what, I turn, what turns out might end up being really ugly. I have no idea. Um, I'm just creating this on the fly. So I don't really like that rotation. Maybe it needs to rotate over a little bit more. Yeah, something like that. Now maybe. I'm tired of the flat UI, and I want these to, to have a little bit of shadow to them. So maybe I'll take this background, and I'll add a gradient. 
So I'll come over here on the left, or excuse me, on the right side, and I'll click the gradient, and I'm going to select a radial gradient, and I want these to flip here. So we'll put the white on the outside and the black on the inside, and I'm going to extend the black so that it's just the very outside that's being shaded here. And then I want to adjust the colors. So I'm going to come I'm going to double click on this little slider and I'm going to change the color to be maybe a light blue or something like that. And then I'll also change this color so that it's a different shade of blue. I should have actually flipped these backwards. Like this. Maybe it's something like that. And then maybe ultimately I'll take these and go back to Pathfinder, go ahead and divide them so that I can select this middle one here and have that go away. So maybe it's something like that with a little bit of shade. I don't know. right? Maybe this one needs a white band around it. So let me take this and we'll add a little stroke around it. Increase the thickness here, something like that. I don't know. I don't know what's right. The point is that I can work with these shapes, and I can create anything that I would be after. Now, maybe it's not the shapes that you want. Maybe you're after something that's like the uh, Twitter logo or something. Uh, and maybe it's um, instead of a bird, it's a, I don't know, what's a good, a what? A hammer. Sure. Why not? A hammer. Right, so I could use the pen tool to start to create this stuff. So maybe I want to do the hammer of the, the, the handle of the hammer. We'll add a little bit of curvature to it here. Something like that. Oh, I'm going to flip so that I have no stroke. Well, let's flip it that way so that we can just see the lines here for a second. Maybe we'll curve this a little bit. Something like that. We'll come up. That a little bit right there, and then we'll connect. So there's there's the handle of my hammer. If I flipped it, you could see the shape a little bit better. And then maybe I need to build the actual the head of the hammer. So we'll do a straight line to there. Sorry, I have to zoom in a little bit. To see this better. And let's go that. And so you guys can clearly see that I'm, I'm making this up on the fly, right? <laughs> so it may or may not turn out the way that I want it to, and it may take some uh, adjustments. Oops, that one's too long. That one definitely will take an adjustment. And we'll come back with the, the white direct selection tool so I can adjust this a little bit. That needs to go up a little bit. This should really come back. Bear with me. I'll get there. OK, so maybe it's something like that. Right? I probably need another control point there, or I need to flatten it out. But the point is that I'm working to create whatever this logo would be. Right? This is really ugly. Sorry. Such is life, right? Yeah, these, these guys need to go back. Whatever, we'll get there. <laughs> the point is that I can create something like this, and then I could take this, and I could put something behind it. And then you right click, arrange, send to back. And I could select all of them. It's hard because you can't see them, they're there. And I could do the Pathfinder, and I could say Subtract. And then I would have that cut out of this shape or something like that. Right? And so maybe it's just a matter of continuing to finesse this. And ultimately, you can end up with whatever it is that, that you want. 
you guys have spent a lot of time drawing with the pen tool, so you're not limited to any of the preset shapes that I, I did. You may have to actually create these on your own. So if you wanted a hammer, maybe you'd create it um, and kind of work through it that way. Maybe there's, you know, the, the top of the hammer is solid. This becomes, you know, the same color but a set of strokes. Something like this. I'm going to change the align strokes so that they're on the inside. Do you guys see how I did that? They were here in the center, which is the default, but they were getting wider than where I wanted it. Let me change the color here so you can maybe see this in contrast. Yeah, can you guys see that the, the, the line that represents this is in the middle? I can change the align strokes such that the line is on the outside and the stroke all falls on the inside, which can be beneficial if I'm trying to maintain a particular shape as part of this um, drawing. Make sense? So your purpose today is to go through and create your own logo. It may take you several multiple iterations to get to a logo that you actually like. Notice that there is a step in part three where you need to ask the person next to you whether they think your logo is working or not. Right? If somebody were to ask me whether, whether I thought the hammer was working or not, I'd say it needs some more work. Right? And hopefully you'd tell me that too. Okay? So talk to your neighbor, and then ultimately you're going to export your work as a PNG file, and you're going to post that to the course website. You do need to comment on this exercise. Okay? And if you run into anything in, in specifics. Uh, I will point out one other thing. I have a little bit more time. And that is that if you created a shape, let me... And we will cover this in a little bit more detail, but some of you will, will get to a shape like this today, and I want to point it out. So let's say that I, I worked through and I created something. And I had this shape, and I wanted to be able to fill in this space or fill in that space. Okay. Um, there is a tool that is in um, Illustrator that will let you fill in regions. It's called the Live Paint tool, and it's available on the side here underneath the Shape Builder tool. You can press K to get to it. Um, what the Live Paint tool does, and what I would recommend doing if you have a set of lines that you ultimately are going to do a live paint on, before you do the live paint, duplicate the layer. So I'm going to select Duplicate Layer and then work on the copy while you do this live paint because sometimes you mess things up and you want to go back. So uh, what I'll do is I'll be working on the, the, the copy. I'll select all of my lines. I'll go to the Live Paint Layer, or excuse me, the Live Paint button. And I'm going to fill with a particular color so you can see this happen. Oops, that was not supposed to happen. Hold on. Live Paint. There we go. And when I move my cursor, it gives me the live paint option, and it also says click to make a live paint group. And so when I click, it will then make a live paint group out of this particular object. At that point, I can choose to pick a color to fill with. And when I click inside a region, it will fill in that region with a particular color. Now, I can't do it outside here because it's not a closed shape. Right? It needs to have lines all the way around it for me to do that. I could also pick a different color for different fill regions. So I could say I want that one to be this color, etc. When I'm done, I can just click off and, and move on. Or there's a button for expand at the top bar here in the ribbon. If I click that expand button, it will make separate shapes out of these objects such that I can select them and then move them after the fact. So if I hadn't clicked that expand button, it wouldn't let me click the individual shapes. So anyway, uh, that is something that is definitely an advanced thing that most of you probably won't use today. You'll use it a little bit later on in the semester. But I like to throw it out there uh, because some of you might need to use it depending on the shapes that you're creating today. All right? Any other questions? No? All right.